This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. I hope you all had fantastic weekends on this Memorial Day and a lot of sports going on. We had Game 7 last night between the Heat and the Celtics. The Heat coming out on top. We're going to talk about that series between them and the Nuggets coming up later on this week. But for today, we're going to talk some golf. The Memorial Tournament is coming up this week. It is an elevated field once again. We're going to talk to Brandon Gadula to break down that event. Talk about his favorite bets at FanDuel Sportsbook. Then I'll go through some MLB bets for today as well. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire. Joined here as mentioned by Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula13. You can find his work over at NumberFire.com where he is a senior managing editor. Brandon, happy Tuesday to you. I didn't flub that for once. How you doing today you did a great job jim good good work i was petrified this morning i would forget that it was tuesday because I had a very weird work schedule yesterday given that it was memorial day i tried to plan my schedule around plopping myself in front of the tv during the two nascar races which meant that i didn't start work until 11 and then worked until 12 30 it was like a little bit of an odd schedule for sure so it does not feel like a tuesday to me so there were two races on monday yeah there was a lot of rain this weekend which meant that Uh, i got two races on sunday and two races on monday and personally i am in favor of that going forward i just prefer that the nascar ones not be monday because it messes up my schedule as far as logging data and getting models ready for the next week yeah that makes sense i had uh had some memorial day plans and uh they they were in the evening but of course monday night uh, game seven had to mm-hmm. catch up on that and of course can't go to bed without knowing uh what happened on monday night raw so it was a, it was a late <laughs> night for, for me as well so did you dvr raw and watch the heat celtics game live or what was the configuration for you uh they were both dvr'd because we were out pretty late so it was a late night but so you, you know. dvr'd both at di- so you dvr'd both and watched them back to back yes what time did you go to bed uh, As your late. life manager, I feel like I need to. Ask <laughs> too too late, let's say. Okay, so we're both uh, we're both operating at one hundred percent right now, is what you're saying. I mean, my I, my analysis is all done, so I don't worry about that. It's more the delivery, and if you ask me to, you know, say something else, I might be a little. A little slow on the, the intake. Well, as you regard. know, I like you love. I know you love surprise questions off the cuff that you've not prepped for. Uh, any initial thoughts for you on Nuggets Heat? They don't have to be betting in insights. Just kind of general, you know, based on your feel for those two teams. Not betting, just Brandon. What are your thoughts on that series first look? Yeah, so I'm just, I'm the kind of person who, if you ask me that, I'd rather have like three minutes to think and then have like a good answer um, no. off the cuff. Prepare. Yeah. It's, it's going to be... It's going to be tough, I think, for the Heat to hang offensively because mm-hmm. the Celtics, they had some horrendous three-point shooting in the series. Jason Tatum rolling his ankle early uh, in Game 7, clearly not 100%. Jalen Brown just, sh- I don't know, shrunk in the moment or something. And it was weird because he was he was good in the finals last year Yeah, uh, whenever they needed him. So. Uh, I don't know if they're if the Heat are going to get that many opportunities where the opposing offense kind of lets them stay in the game, unless you know they get another incredible showing from Caleb Martin. So I don't know how you don't go into this thinking that the Heat are the clear underdogs, which you know it's not a surprise, but right. hasn't really stopped them before. So I think it's going to be fun. It's one of those. It's it's sometimes it's sometimes tough with underdogs where you feel you want the underdogs to win, but you also want the best games possible. So yeah. in the back of my mind, I was like, I, I think I kind of want the Celtics to win for a better uh, the a higher probability of a competitive series. But I think it's time that we all just uh, quit doubting the Heat anyway. So. Uh, the market is because their money line to win the series is plus three thirty. So uh, 
sure that they yeah. will not use that for motivation at all, as they have definitely not had a chip on their shoulder this entire time. We'll talk more about the series, as mentioned, later on this week. To get the insights on the NBA Finals and uh, the Stanley Cup Finals and more, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be breaking down all that later on this week, plus more as always. So go subscribe to your platform podcast platform of choice and also check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page uh, to get all the insights there as well. Let's kick things off now, Brandon, though, by talking about this week's PGA Tour event. It is at Muirfield Village. It is the Memorial Tournament, and we know what to expect of this course. They had a redesign a couple years ago, but a lot of data here from this course. So what should we know about Muirfield before we fill out our bet slips for the Memorial? Yeah, uh, long par 72, over 7,500 yards. Um, and despite that length, the fairways are they're, – they're not, they're not narrow per se, but missing them is problematic, so you don't want to miss the fairways here. And so that kind of makes driving a really strange combination for, uh, for the week because, yes, the distance helps – but you can't just be spraying it. Uh, Data Golf has a, a pretty pretty lowered importance on driving distance and a much higher relative importance on driving accuracy uh, for this week as a result. Now, what we do with that information, that's always a question that we have. Uh, anyone who's ever listened to us on the heat check or you know me at a course where like driving accuracy matters, it's going to sound familiar, but... What that tends to do is bring more golfers into play because more accurate hitters kind of close that gap, especially in the case whenever distance itself is not enough um, for the longer hitters to keep that separation. That being said, you don't just have driving accuracy ranking in your spreadsheet or something like that and give it a ton of weight because there's a lot more to golf than just hitting the fairway. You know, a lot of these golfers could hit the fairway if they clubbed down and had no, you know, no uh, need to hit it far as well. Um, we're not, we're, you know, they're not going to be hitting irons off the tee just to hit the fairway. doesn't work that way. So I think whenever driving accuracy comes into play, it can get really uh, convoluted uh, for, for, you know, for people trying to break things down. So what I like to do in these instances is look at strokes it off the tee and have like a slight emphasis on driving accuracy. So like, five to 10% at most, not something absurd uh, with the driving accuracy numbers, which is, and driving accuracy itself is not a great stat uh, to begin with. But not only do we have like uh, troublesome fairways to miss, we have small greens. The greens on average here, 5,000 square feet. PGA Tour average is around 6,000 square feet. So that's going to put an emphasis on strokes gained around the green, where they're going to miss greens. They're going to have to get up and down. Strokes gained around the green is important. So, you know, iron play always super vital at any course, especially at a course with those small greens and, you know, whenever you're going to be hitting stuff out of the rough. So um, it's important uh, to be really good with all three of your tee to green areas, just to uh, different degrees for this week. Strokes getting around the green is a key stat for me. So that kind of means that if I factor in putting, it's all around golf, but I mean, this course plays tough uh, winning scores on average over the past five years have been like 11.8 under par. And we've had like a lot of multi-shot winners. So like the sort of hypothetical, you know, first place you need is going to be even lower than that. So it's going to be somewhat similar to, to the scoring conditions we had last week. And so that then does re-raise the, the stakes uh, for the better golfers, because when things play tough for better golfers, tend to separate with a designated field. I mean, we have a lot of great golfers. So basically, you know, there's not a key stat that I think is the key stat this week. It's more having a good all around game and a good enough all around game to beat a lot of great golfers in the field. So I want, I want driving a little bit of driving accuracy, uh, irons and wedges for the week. Okay. Now you mentioned how the fact that it's a non-distance course does put more golfers in play, but as you said, it's a tougher course too, which kind of has a push and pull here where you think it would gravitate towards the top guys. So let's take a look at the odds board here over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Scotty Scheffler is the favorite at six to one. John Rahm, seven to one. Now Rory McIlroy kind of came back a bit at the PGA Championship and showed some life once again, but he's down at 14 to one. 
to you, given that McElroy is behind Xander Shoffley and Patrick Cantlay, did Rory do enough to you to like spark some interest in buying low on him, especially now with his odds lengthening out to 14 to one, or is it still really Scheffler and Rom as being like a two horse race at the top here? Yeah. With Rory, he's not really in that tier for me just mm-hmm. yet. Um, my model looks at long-term form. So over the past year and gives more weight to recent rounds. So obviously he's not going to look quite as good as, Scotty Scheffler and John Rahm in particular, but I have them also behind fittingly here. Patrick Cantlay and Xander Schauffele. So I think that 14 to one is reasonable uh, for Rory in terms of, you know, they're not going to make Rory 25 to one, right? Even though maybe that's where my model says he should be. They should Um, do it. Just do it. I'm just saying like, I don't think that we're we're ever going to see massive amounts of value on on Rory, but mm-hmm. you know, for for me, it, it's Scheffler and Rom. They both have uh, at least eleven percent uh, odds to win. Rory's under four percent for me, and then that tier two of of really good friends, uh, Patrick Cantlay and Xander Schauffele. So, I think the odds order is right, but boy, it's it's really tight this week. Six to one and seven to one. And then also 10 to one and 12 to one. It's not leaving a whole lot. And, uh, you know, the thing is those guys aren't substantially, according to my model, like overvalued by any means. Sure. So, so they suck you... up win equity, but don't give you betting value. Yeah. Best and that, combo. That's the word. Yeah. That's, you know, and if we're not being using that word, ironically, it's, it's really the worst because it's not enough to get there with these guys. Um, but it doesn't really leave a whole lot else uh, down the rest of the odds board. So for me this week, unfortunately, it's it's shaping up to be a little bit more of a – it's going to be more like finishing positions, um, sure. some matchups, uh, any special things that we can get our, our hands on because I'm not seeing a whole lot in the outright market. Anything in the outright market for you or nothing at all? So – with Patrick Cantlay at 10 to 1, it's justifiable, I'll say. It's close enough. Um, Cantlay has, like, with an asterisk here, um, what is it, two wins over the past four years? Um, one of those where John Rom withdrew due to the, the COVID test. Um, with like a four shot lead after yeah. seven or after fifth, whatever. I can't do math. Whatever yeah. three times 18 is 50, 54, 54. Sick. Yeah. yeah. First time. Um, I benefited from that personally, so <laughs> it's, it's fine but by me. Um, but yeah, just something to keep an, keep an eye on with that, that win. I mean, not that you should ever make your decisions based on who's won here in the past. That's all I look at. You just sort by wins. Well, if you're at Billy Horschel at uh, 12 to one for this week. (laughs) Yeah. Back the back to back narrative uh, tends to work out um, a lot, but I mean, if you're, if in seriousness, like if you're factoring in course history a lot, it's John Rahm and and Cantlay Mm -hmm. very specifically, those two guys kind of stand out. Um, But, you know, Cantlay 10 to one, I wouldn't really argue. I have them at 11 to one. So again, mm. it's just a lot of those like one or two points away and it's not enough for me to want to, you know, just cause I don't always trust the model. Uh, sometimes it, it comes back to bite me, but I think it's close enough where you could justify it. Other than that, uh, with Cantlay, like Sung J M is currently 35 to one. He's accurate off the tee. His form overall has been fine, not not a standout. So I see the case for Sung Jay. Sure. But boy, it's a really tight field, uh, or a really tight board at the top of the field. And I see some like sprinkles of value on guys. And I, I'm I might get Wyndham Clark where I say it's just a sprinkle and then I don't actually get the full <laughs> full credit for it on the show. But it's not the kind like that you look at the designated event winners and Clark is Clark and Kurt Kitayama are basically the two outliers. So yeah. you don't want to be throwing a lot of units yeah. on any of these uh, any of these longer shots. But, you know, 
instead of betting a ton of guys at the top of the board, you can do partial units on sure. some of these longer shots, which I'm all right with. In that event, uh, the names I'd be looking at are Russell Henley at 55 to one, Tom Kim at 60, Keegan Bradley, Keegan Bradley at 90, uh, and even Matt Kuchar at 100 to one. If I just took a unit and kind of put a quarter unit on those four guys, sure. I'd at least feel like I was getting some expected value. But with you know, it, it's tough whenever there's not a whole lot at the top of the board, and it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a list of, it's like murderers row up there at the at the top of the board. So it's always tough going against them. And it sounds like, based on your sentiment, that that M at thirty five is not someone you would bet personally. It's more so you say he's justifiable. I'm going to bet him out of fear of missing out. Okay. Because I have him at 37. Sure. Okay. And at okay. least at that rate, I'm like, you know, but it's different whenever it's, I have someone at seven and they're six. That yeah. feels different. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So the ones you like the most sounds like are Russell Henley, 55 to one, Tom Kim, 60 to one, Keegan Bradley at 90 and Matt Kuchar. At a hundo. What about the non outrights? What are you seeing there this week? Yeah. So this is where I'm really going to uh, jump in. Um, again, Patrick Cantlay, first round leader, 22 to one. Mm-hmm. Slight value there in my first round leader model. Uh, also gets you some coverage if, if he gets out to a good start. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't like this is not always the case, but I don't mind, again, partial unit on guys you like or are close to and just going first round leader because those odds are a lot different. And then you kind of get that like peace of mind and generally things correlate quite well mm-hmm. with those odds, but can't land my first round leader model does look, um, does look solid. Xander Shoffley top 10 plus one sixty. He's in great form. He's been top 10 or sorry, top 20 in four straight years here. Uh, you asked me if like Rory McElroy was on, on par with, John Rahm and Scotty Scheffler and he's not and Xander isn't either, but he's pretty close. He's really, really good right now. His irons are great. And that's kind of one of the knocks as someone who's loved Xander over the years. He wasn't as good of an iron player as some of the best guys. The iron stats for him right now are pretty phenomenal. So um, top 10 for him. I like that. Uh, Tom Kim top 20 plus 220. Uh, Really accurate off the tee. Irons are still there. Putting's a bit up and down. The putting stats from 5 to 10 feet, not particularly great or bad. So I'm all right with that. I think this is a gen- you know generally an overall good course fit uh, for someone who will gain some leverage based on uh, being accurate. And then kind of a stab here, but it's more to do with the uh, the the rest of the, the players in this uh in this prop group, top South African, Gary Kigo plus 300. Hmm. He's really going up against Christian Bezadenhout, who is deservedly the favorite at plus 135 in that market. Uh, MJ Duffy is, he can kind of pop here and there, but this almost feels like a glorified head to head. And sure. so there, my model is showing a slight value on Gary Kigo at uh, three to one there. You can get that in the prop market over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Top South African, he go a plus 300 there. Other ones Brandon mentioned again. Uh, Cantlay first round leader, 22 to 1. Xander top 10, plus 160. And Tom Kim top 20, plus 220. Did want to go briefly back to the Rob discussion about Rob and Weirfield. Looking back at the COVID year where he tested positive mid-event. Uh, if you look at the first three rounds there, Data Golf's true strokes gained. If you want to guess uh, his true strokes gain per round, the first three rounds before he had to withdraw because of a positive COVID test. Uh, what number are you putting on John Rom per round above the field? Um, after accounting so, for course or uh, difficulty and stuff. So outlier like rates, an, are like, like an elite number. You know, four is like elite. Like that's like, like a, nuts. John Rom um, at the Genesis was 4.67. That's a bananas event. Uh he was probably like a a four and a half. 7.43. <laughs> no. Really? Yeah. 
absolutely unreal unhinged it was a three-round sample so it's like you know a smaller oh, yeah, sample he was rounds, but like that's well he absurd. was that far out he was eight he was 18 under yeah and it's sick <laughs> can't they want it in a playoff at 13 under yeah yeah i had no right winning that that ticket but yeah i mean we all get lucky sometimes. We remember the bad beats. We don't remember the the bad wins, but you know, sometimes they do happen. So, but uh, either way, excited for this week's event. We're gonna talk more about that on the DFS side of things later on today. We'll be talking about that over on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast. But for today here on the podcast, Brandon, want to thank you for coming on as always. Good luck to you with the memorial. Have fun with the NBA Finals, and we'll talk to you once again next week. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. All right, check out Brandon on Twitter at Cadula13. Find his work and his simulations for golf over at numberfire.com. We're going to dive in to tonight's baseball slate here in just one second. But first, make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now, new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. There's no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sports book, FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus in president select states. First online real money wager only. $10 deposits required. Refund issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Arizona. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533-42. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777. Or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700. In Kansas, ksgamblinghealth.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Massachusetts, gamblinghelplinema.org. Or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. And West Virginia, Go to 1-800-GAMBLER.NET. Let's take a look now at tonight's MLB slate where I've got two money lines and two strikeout props where I'm showing value right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Let's begin things off with the money line. That is for the Orioles and the Guardians. I like the Orioles money line here at minus 142. My model is the Orioles went off at 62%. Implied odds here, 59%. And... I'm guessing there are a couple reasons why that is the case. The first one is the offense is here because the Guardians offense last year got by as being like the scrappy team. Not a lot of power, but because they never struck out, they wound up having pretty good numbers despite that. That is not carried over into this year. Their WRC plus against righties in the current active roster is 79. Power is still crazy low at 116 for the ISO there. So they've not been a good offense. Second, I'm kind of skeptical Cal Quantrill, their starter, will be as able to outperform his peripherals as he was last year. He did that by having a very good hard hit rate. So when you look at stuff like Skill Interactive ERA, I think it undercounts the value of a low hard hit rate, personally. And it can, it can I think, that, be, that have it be its biggest weak spot. So Quantrill last year outperformed his Skill Interactive ERA because he did such a good job of suppressing hard contact. This year, he has not been doing that. And as a result, his expected ERA, which I think does a better job looking backward at quantifying stuff like hard hit rate, it does, it's not as good of a forecaster, I don't think, as Skill Interactive ERA, but does a better job looking backward. And his expected ERA is 5.54, so almost a full run higher than his actual ERA at 4.75. So Quantrill this year hasn't been the same pitcher as he was last year, is now facing an Orioles offense that I respect quite a bit and think could do pretty well here. So I'm not super high on Kyle Gibson, the Orioles starter, but given the offensive differences here and given the fact that I do think that um, Quantrill probably not going to live up to what he did last year, I think there is enough to justify buying into the Orioles here at minus 142. So the Orioles money line to me, a good bet at minus 142 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. 
I have a money line in the strikeout prop in the same game right now. That is for the Cubs and the Rays. And the money line is going to be on the Cubs at plus 168. The strikeout prop is going to be Kyle Hendricks over three and a half at minus 126. I don't want to pair those together personally. We can look at uh, what that looks like if you want to in just one second. But first, let's talk about the Cubs money line here. It's not fun to bet against Shane McClanahan and the Rays. That has not gone well for people who have done so, so far this year. So I go in knowing that's the case. But clearly, the market knows that because the Cubs' money line, uh, their win odds here under 38%, despite the fact they're at home here, that's pretty low. Kyle Hendricks uh, making his second start here for the Cubs this year. He's had ups and downs, uh, or had ups and downs in his debut, but increased strikeout right there. Uh, his velocity is better than it was last year. And we saw that increased strikeout rate in his rehab stints as well. I think that's kind of interesting, but it is potentially not sticky. The Cubs offense, I think is stickier. They've been very good against lefties so far this year. And you look at the composition of that lineup. There are a lot of good righties in that lineup. So I think like logically it makes sense. They'd be good against lefties. It's a small sample. Don't want to buy in fully to what they've done so far this year. But I think they have the components to be very good against lefties. So McClanahan is a very good pitcher. His ERA is sub two this year, and he's deserved that. He has earned that. Good strikeout numbers. Pretty good batted ball data as well. But pretty tough test here for today. Now, it's plus 168 for a reason. So the odds this bet cashes are pretty low. Uh, the implied odds there are 37.3%. So you have to keep that in mind. As always, when it's lower probability bets, keep in mind the odds that that bet hits are lower. So account for that within how much money you put into this bet. But I'm higher on the Cubs in the market. I think it's a worthwhile investment personally. And do you want to take their money line at plus 168? Now, I think one way you can do that is to scale the money line bet with the Hendricks strikeout prop over three and a half, where if one of them hits, you profit. There are pretty easy ways to do that. Uh, so let's take a look here at the Hendricks strikeout prop over three and a half, currently minus 126 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Talked before about the increased velo, talked about the increased strikeout rate. His swing and strike rate in that game was 9.3%. Now, I was actually on Hendricks under in that first start because I didn't think his pitch count would be very high. You look back to the rehab stints and... They kept his pitch count pretty low, but in that game, 86 pitches for Hendricks. So I'm okay projecting him around 90 for tonight. Another step forward here as he gets one step uh, deeper, one start deeper into his return. And again, the strikeouts were there in the rehab stint too. So it's a very good offense, but they're not a low strikeout offense. They are better than average in that department. The Rays are, but not like a crazy outlier in terms of the strikeout rate. So how I'd play this personally is I'd scale these two bets where if you win one of them, you can get a profit for the night. Given the Cubs money line is plus 168, that's pretty easy to do. Again, Hendricks over three and a half minus 126. If you wanted to pair them together via same game parlay or at FanDuel Sportsbook, uh, the over with um, the money line at plus 168, that gets you plus 301 odds. I don't think that's good enough to tempt me, given the money line is plus 168. So I need a bit a bit steeper than that personally to go at this one. That's why I want to go with separate selections uh, with the Hendricks strikeout over and the money line at plus 168, scaling them where if one of them uh, does hit, I profit for the bet overall. Let's finish up here with one more strikeout prop for tonight. That is in the Reds and Red Sox game. Seen some movement on this game right now. So we'll see where the strikeout prop is right now. Ben Lively over three and a half is still minus 102. It was plus 106 this morning. So there's Ben's movement towards the over. Even at minus 102, I still think that's good enough to take because Lively is getting a lot of leash right now. It's now minus 104 as we are talking here right now. But I uh, still think there is some value there. Once it gets to minus 115, I think it's minus 106 now. It's moving in real time. Once it gets to minus 115, I'm probably out of Lively. So if you're if you check this after I'm done recording, you see it's minus 115, I probably would stop. If it's longer than minus 115, I'm okay with Lively right now. The reason I had interest here in Lively to begin with was because I don't think this number reflects how much leash he got in his last start. He won 103 pitches last time out, and he got eight strikeouts there. It was his second consecutive start with eight strikeouts. He was not doing this in the minors, so I don't expect Lively to do that again, but I'm also not projecting him to do that again. I've got him projected for more than four strikeouts for today. 
closer to five actually than four, which is why I'm okay getting to minus 115 and over three and a half. I have a hard time projecting fewer strikeouts for a guy who is getting that much leash, can go over 100 pitches. It is on the road against the Red Sox, and they are a low strikeout offense, but I do still think there is value here. So lively over three and a half strikeouts, as long as it is minus 115 or longer, I'm okay with it. Minus 106 right now as we record here. I still think that's okay, but getting closer to where uh, I would jump ship. So bet recommendations for today in baseball. Ben Lively over three and a half strikeouts, minus 106. Kyle Hendricks over three and a half strikeouts, minus 126. The Cubs money line at plus 168. And the Orioles money line at minus 142, all available over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Now, before we close up shop for today, do you got to go back to last week and recap the bet recommendations here from the show and overall pretty solid week uh, for our guests here on the show. First one, Brandon Gnu, let's start things off here with PGA for the Charles Schwab Challenge. Emiliano Grillo won that event and Grillo has been a favorite of ours over on the DFS side of things for a while. So fun to see him win. No outrights for Brandon on Grillo. Outrights there were Denny McCarthy, 55 to one, Brendan Todd, 90 to one, and then Andrew put him at 100 to one. First round leader bets of Brandon were Russell Henley, 45 to one and JJ spawn 80 to one. Harry Hall shot a 62 in the first round. So he was three shots clear of everybody else. So no wins there, but we'll see if we can bounce back at the Memorial. Good week by Austin Cass, our EPL guy uh, for the final weekend of EPL. Check out Austin on Twitter at Austin Cass and find his work over at number fire. Austin was heavy on Arsenal this past week and he liked over two and a half goals at plus 128. He liked their first half money line at minus 130 and both those hit because Arsenal was up three nil in the first half and they won five nil. So very easily hitting both those pretty much right away. He also liked Bekei Osaka to score or assist, and he notched that goal, uh, got that that bet via a goal in the 27th minute. So all three Arsenal bets did wind up winning. Good call by Austin there. Uh, Arsenal, very good to him uh, over the weekend. One of the other bets was Fulham to win or draw at plus 155 against Manchester United. They lost 2-1. to one. They did score in the 79th minute to get it close to the draw there, but couldn't quite get the equalizer. So they did lose there. Couldn't quite get that one at plus 155. And then the final one was Damari Gray to score or assist at minus 110. They did score, but uh, Gray was not involved in it. So overall, still a great day for Austin via the Arsenal bets. Hopefully uh, those were enough for you to profit. And uh, again, check out Austin on Twitter at Austin Katz. Our guest to preview the Indy 500 and the Coke 600 was Dr. Nick Giffen. Check him out on Twitter at Rotodoc. Find his work at the Action Network and on the Stacking Denny's and Running Hot podcast. In the Indy 500, tough one here for Nick because Kyle Kirkwood was running well and running sixth, I believe, at the time but got caught up in a wreck, not of his own doing, and flipped, and it was his tire who almost went in the stands. Uh, outrides for Nick were Alex Polo, 6-1, to one, Santino Ferrucci, if you could get him at 20-1, to one, and then Ryan hunter Ray as a fun one, 65-1. to one. Winner there was Joseph Newgarden, finally getting that first win for him, getting win for Team Penske at Indy. He talked about hunter Ray, top Chevy at 30-1, to one, but uh, Newgarden was a Chevy there, so couldn't get that one. Nick, though, had a great read on the Cup Series race. He liked Ross Chastain 11 1, as did I, which would have been uh, my bet recommendation for the show if we had done those last week. Didn't work. Ross uh, had some issues or was gaining track position, then got caught in a thing on pit road and just kind of ruined his race. But Nick said to find markets to bet Bubba Wallace, who finished fourth. I had a, a Wallace over Chase Elliott uh, head to head, so there were good Bubba markets out there. Top five bet cashed, uh, the Elliott head to head cashed. I think there was a group bet that cashed too. So if you were looking for Bubba markets, given he finished fourth, probably did pretty well there. But the big thing by Nick was he said he liked the Penske cars of Joey Logano and Ryan Blaney because of the weather we'd see this weekend. He'd said it helped the Fords quite a bit. And Blaney went out and won in, I would say, pretty dominant fashion. Blaney was 22 to 1 at FanDuel. He was as long as 30 to 1 other places. And his car was sick. So good process by Nick. Great bet by Nick. Great win by Nick with Ryan Blaney. Check him out on Twitter at Rotodoc. Check out his podcast, Stacking Denny's and the Running Hot Podcast, and find his work at the Action Network. Good process, good results. You always love when that occurs. I had just one bet for F1 at Monaco uh, for the Monaco Grand Prix. I had shown value in Max Verstappen to win at minus 120, but I was worried about qualifying because I thought if Verstappen couldn't get the pole, it'd be tough for him to get the win. So to account for that, I took uh, Verstappen to win both the pole and the race, which was plus 220. In that instance, 
the two bets were highly correlated because of how tough it is to pass in Monaco, whereas I think they're being treated as effectively as like a traditional parlay. Not straight up because it was accounted for a bit, but I think the correlation should have been much tighter between those two markets. Verstappen won the poll Saturday, had a final, uh, his third sector time was fantastic to get the poll away from Fernando Alonso. And even with rain on Sunday, Verstappen won. Uh, that cashed. I don't know if my handicap on Verstappen was right, given how close uh, Fernando Alonso was, given I benefited from Sergio Perez wrecking and qualifying too. I probably got a bit lucky in the handicap, but I think that the process of finding that market specifically was correct. So I feel great about that part of it, and I'm glad it worked out as well as it did. I think that's always something we should be mindful of, is finding the proper market for betting our assumptions, and I think that one worked out really well. So Nick hitting uh, the Ryan Blaney outright. I got Verstappen, plus 220 to win the poll on the race. Austin Cass via the Arsenal stuff. Good week overall in the show. Hoping to run it back once again this week with another good week of recommendations. That's all we got here for covering the spread for today. We're going to preview the NBA Finals coming up later on this week, though, so make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating as well, or on YouTube, give us a thumbs up over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Thank you once again to Brandon Gandula for swinging by, breaking down his thoughts on the Memorial Tournament. Check out Brandon on Twitter, at Gandula13. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnet. J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across baseball for tonight. We'll talk to you once again later on this week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 